Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker. Oh, the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Fall to your knees. Devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Motherfucking knees. Are- Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Some content may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. We say fuck a lot. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. You should just change your name to Molasses because you're slow as hell. I was moving fast. Oh, my gosh. I've never in my life met a man who takes so long to get ready for anything. Well, you know what they say. People who take a long time are geniuses. Okay, enough of that sidebar. We don't have time for that mess. You have an incredible long story for us today, but I must thank today's sponsors. I would like to thank Andrea and Heather, who so graciously donated at Patreon. Thank you. We appreciate it. Also, it's kind of interesting how now all of a sudden you want to get to the point. Okay, so. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is a I case. love the energy. I love it. Yeah, well, you know, this is how we thrive. Um, we've had this case in the bag for some time, and actually, I would like to thank our patron, Stephanie. She's awesome and sent us the book that is our main resource for today's case. She is the book goddess. That is Shallow Graves by Maureen Boyle. This is a big case, Dylan. It is. And I'm actually surprised it's not one of those cases that get a ton of attention. I mean, we we talk about that quite a bit. You get these these cases that are just like mind blowing, wow, and you've hardly heard of it. Now, I must say, this area uh, as a whole is like the triangle of death. I mean, so much murder and various dumping ground. I mean, it's just crazy. It really it blows my mind that this is not, you know, top 10, 20 true crime all time. Are you talking about uh, New England as the triangle of death? <laughs> yes. Well, I want to move there. It's like every now, 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 the well, death triangle. You were telling me about this, and you were like, "Well, you can investigate this group of killings here and there, and you know, see what you think about the connections to today's story." And I'm just like, "Oh my god!" I know when we decided to focus a month to each particular part of Appalachia State, what have you, and we decided to group New England into the month of April. I had a really difficult time narrowing down what we should cover because I have probably 50 cases that I want to cover that we're eventually going to get to, but we have to sort of choose just a couple right now. So let's get into it, Dylan. Are you ready? Yes. Let's dive straight in. 60 miles south of Baston, Massachusetts. Oh, that's up near where they got beans. New right. Bedford is a historic. <laughs> <You're>, what the <laughs> fuck? That's your first thought about Boston. I love Boston baked beans. I'm sorry. Oh I don't know what to God. say. Oh, my God. Do you guys hear what? I like a Boston cream donut. Okay. I'm going to start over. 60 miles south of Boston, Massachusetts, New Bedford is a historic town that sits at the confluence of the Acushnet or Acushnet River and Buzzards Bay. It's what one might picture when daydreaming of a historic New England water town. The gas lantern street lamps, cobblestone streets, and colonial homes where sea captains' wives once waited for their men to return from whaling expeditions. I bet they were so happy when they got back. Just like when I get home, right? From work. (laughs) Okay, moving along. I'm moving along here. The city's fortunes peaked in the 1850s when a, I thought you meant like the women were happy their men were back. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, moving along. The city's fortunes peaked in the 1850s when a demand for whale oil was high. Herman Melville's Moby Dick. You ever read that book? I have a long, long time ago. Really? I never read that. Really? I had to read Herman Melville's Billy Budd. I'm not familiar with Billy Budd. Um, yeah, that was like the worst. I hated that book. Like well, passion. So I, that turned me against reading Moby Dick. But maybe I should pick up a copy. I'm surprised because you, you covered most of the classics, and that's certainly a part of uh, the American classics. Moby Dick was set in New Bedford. Do you remember that part? Uh, yes, I do. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a you know, huge whaling community and uh whole lot of history there in New Bedford. By the 1860s, the whaling industry was in decline, but 
that was replaced with textile mills. Now the city is rich only in history. By 1988, New Bedford was a busy seaport with working class families who tended to grow up, buy houses, and stay in the area. But like a lot of areas facing economic depressions, the small city was gripped by addiction. Many women who were affected by drug addiction turned to prostitution. Many of the sex workers frequented an area known as Weld Square, an underbelly of sorts in New Bedford, where crack and heroin were endemic. In 1988, a clinic treated nearly 400 heroin addicts a day, a stat second only um, in the state to Boston. Wow. The prostitution that accompanied drugs in Weld Square became known as the Weld Square Dance. (laughs) That's an interesting name. Another area was at the South End. Many of the women worked the rundown neighborhood along Purchase Street, sometimes pacing up and down, other times lingering on the corners while Johns drove by slowly. Most of the sex work happened during the day. Just right out in front of everybody. With the busiest hours being right before school let out. Fathers would cruise by before picking up their children. For $20, a woman would turn a trick in order to buy a single packet of heroin. You you know, that that makes total sense. If if you're looking at a parent who has is very concerned about time management and, and like fuel costs and things of that nature. Um, so if you, you know, shoot down there. You, so not you. No, no, because I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't care at all about time management. You live on Dillon time. <clears throat> yeah, I would just go down there, get me a prostitute, forget to pick my kid up, you know, and then be like, "What do you want me to do?" You it know? becomes an issue. Yeah, they call in like child services. They will too. <laughs> if you're like five minutes late at the school, you got a DSS. Yeah, it's pretty scary. By the time our story takes place, the city had already made national news when a sexual assault at Big Dan's Tavern lasted for hours while bystanders cheered on the rapists. Four men were eventually convicted of assault, and the incident inspired the Jodie Foster movie, The Accused. Oh, my God. I just made that connection that that is the same area. That That is such a horrific story, and we watched a documentary about that case a while back. We did. Very heartbreaking. Yeah, the fact, I, I just don't the know. The victim blaming that went on at this time was just so fucking awful. I would never, ever stand around, even if it's a stranger, and watch someone be assaulted. I would stop those people or I would damn die trying. I feel like her name was Cheryl Arugio, um, but I'm not 100% sure, but that name keeps popping in my head. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, it's a tough watch, but it's, I mean, Jodie Foster, she's she's pretty excellent actress. De- so definitely worth checking out if um, you can deal with the subject matter. Yeah, the extended rape scene. In the 1980s, nearly all crime in New Bedford could be tied to the drug trade. Drug dealing, prostitution, robberies, burglaries, bad checks, and shoplifting. Most city residents knew the women on the streets and sometimes knew how they arrived In that particular situation. At the time, New Bedford's population was about 100,000, with nearly one third being of Portuguese descent, often from large knit families. And because people in the city were tight, they had put down roots and stayed there. They were not tight lipped when it came to reporting crimes. Most people felt comfortable reporting even small bar fights. This meant most murders were solved within a short period of time. And most of them were tied to domestic violence or drugs. So there was very little just random violent crime, like murder. Yes. And, and, and I find it very interesting because any description of this area, even to this day to a large degree, they describe it as a very tight-knit community. And, uh, you know, people are not afraid to tell on you. Everybody knows, kind of knows everybody. Six degrees of separation. Everybody's in your business. So if you happen to be hooked on drugs or working the the weld square dance, then it's most likely somebody knows you, knows your mama, knows your family. Yeah. Y'all went to high school together. I mean, that's kind of the general feel I got while researching. I seen your boy down there, Dosey Doan, down there at the square dance. I'll tell you what. 
Yeah. <laughs> Great joke, Dylan. I, hey, I'm here. That's why I'm here. We all had to learn to do that shit in junior high. It was very weird. Yeah, I did it in a gymnasium and during gym class. I always got stuck with like the stinky partner or some dude who like picked his nose or something and I knew and then he touched my hands and I was just always grossed out. I'm like, why can't I never get paired up with like the hot guy? I must say, with the hot seventh grader, why do I have to dance with this gross guy? The trauma of learning square dancing with you know someone and you know having to touch someone like that, um, I did not relive that until we tried to take dance class, swing dance classes, and you did not. I guess you didn't know either. But as soon as it started, I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be a cool night with my wife." You know, we're gonna have fun. And then immediately, they made you pair up with someone else, a stranger. And everyone else there was a good uh, twenty years our senior, and uh, I don't know a couple couple of them couple of them grandma still had a little something left a little tread left on the tire bud I must say. Okay, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but I, it was totally awkward, and it I just, love how you managed to be sexist and ageist all in one sentence. No, nah, I was just kidding. <laughs> they were the very um the very nice people, very nice people, and they could dance way better than I could. And you had to leave because you got that awkward boner. Because of the Mrs. Robinson that, no, situation that was happening. I didn't do that. Yep. I did not have a chub, I swear. <laughs> okay, let's get back to it. Oh, yeah. Oh, now all of a sudden you want to get to the point again. Okay, in May of 1988, 31-year-old Deborah Maderos tells her mother, Olivia, that she is leaving their home in Fall River to visit her boyfriend who lives in New Bedford. Deborah was a lifelong drug user who had never moved out of her mother's house. And though I couldn't find a great deal of information about her early life, she was the youngest of three sisters. Olivia was accustomed to her daughter leaving for extended periods of time. But a few days later, Olivia received a phone call from Deborah's boyfriend, a man named Russell Oliveria. The the pair had been planning to go on a cruise together. and He said on the night of May 27th, they had gotten into an argument and Deborah left. Now, we hear that story a lot when it comes to missing and murdered women. Oh, we had a fight, she left, and typically it's suspicious. It, she walked away from the house. She got out of the car at a stoplight, walked away. Um, that is always a red flag for me because uh, 99 out of 100 times, it's their partner who did something to them. It's exactly. He had not seen her since, but thought she was back with her mother. Deborah's mom believed her drug addiction dated back to a time she spent as a young teenager in Tiverton, Rhode Island, and agreed that her daughter kept bad company. Though described as cheery, bubbly, Deborah seemed to fall in and out of trouble. She picked up a high school equivalency diploma while serving time in prison, and then she worked in a variety of factory jobs in the Fall River area as an adult. Deborah had a lengthy criminal history, Dylan. In 1986, she was sentenced in New Bedford to 90 days in the House of Corrections in Framingham for possession of hypodermic needle and syringe. She was also placed on three years probation. Again, in 1987 and 1988, Medeiros faced more charges of carrying a needle and syringe, passing bad checks, and armed robbery, which was connected to a bad marijuana deal. And that sounds like a really bad marijuana deal. Her lawyer, Claire Carpenter, told the Boston Globe in an interview that Deborah wouldn't agree she needed help. He had last seen her in March 1988 before she had gone missing and helped her get treatment at a hospital for blood poisoning in her arm. He added, everyone tried to straighten her out, but she just wouldn't listen. Deborah was reported missing by her mother on June 23rd, nearly a month after she was last seen by her boyfriend, Oliveria. Yeah, it sounds like she has all the problems associated with this type of lifestyle. Um, this is certainly not recreational drug use. This is a full blown every day. And that's what's really scary about uh, if it is a heroin addiction, it just consumes you so completely. And through my research, Dylan, from what I understand, when with, of course, law enforcement interviewing various sex workers and, and trying to get a handle on this case as it unfolds, the majority of these women were using five plus bags of heroin a day. So they needed to earn at least 100 bucks a day to keep their habit going. Just to get their drug, and then they need some little bit of food, whatever, yeah. got to stay somewhere. Exactly, that money was just going to purchase drugs. So, I mean, I don't really know a whole lot about 
you know, I mean, we, we all know I'm kind of a square and I don't know a whole lot about drugs. So I'm not exactly sure like how much this little baggie of heroin was, you know, weight wise. All I know is what I saw on the wire. Exactly. <laughs> but five bags a day. I mean, that seems like a lot. of <laughs> I mean, well, if you consider so you go turn a trick or two, you get your bag, you typically go back, go somewhere and do it. And then you're going to have the nodding period of the high period of heroin, which I, I don't know, but it seems like it lasts, you know, some couple hours or so. And then you get up and it's just rinse and repeat, you know, and you're doing this all day long. So it's not hard to see how this just consumed your entire day, your entire life. There's no other time for friends, family, kids, um, a, a, a straight up nine to five job. So this really is just your life. And, and it's sad. It really is, it is sad. It's very sad. Because I mean, just what we've seen, like in documentaries such as Dope Sick, oh my God, et cetera. Um, I mean, you're right. It is all consuming. And I'm all for, we we are we support sex work here at Mountain Murders, and, and we think it should be legitimized, and and the women and men who participate should be everyone should be protected, and uh, you know because you can make these insane amounts of money, but unfortunately in these situations, as soon as they get the money. And they're oftentimes being exploited by other people. Um, the money's gone, and they, it's just, just, it seems like you're giving away such a big part of yourself. It's to, such uh, a cycle. Yeah. Of, of like in and out. It's sad. You know? That part is sad. It was a holiday weekend, July 3rd, when temperatures hovering in the 80s, um, when a man named Alan Al- Alves got a beep. A beeper. Remember beepers? <laughs> oh, man. I never had one because I wasn't rich enough to have one, but I thought it was the coolest thing. He was on call, though he had planned to celebrate Independence Day on his new boat, which sounds awesome. When he phoned into the station, the Freetown officer learned a body had been discovered northbound off Route uh, 140, just over the Lakeville town line. A woman who had stopped by the roadway to take a little pee break had discovered the remains of a deceased woman about 30 feet off the road in a brushy area. The victim was partially naked with a bra wrapped around her neck. It was a classic body dump. A vehicle had pulled off the road, hauled the body far enough off the road so that no one would notice it, if ever. In Massachusetts, an unattended death must be assigned to a state trooper or a state police officer and are required to, they are required to respond to these scenes. So technically, state police are assigned to the case, but they often coordinate with local law enforcement to oversee the crime scene. Yeah, I've always found it interesting how the state police uh, serve such a, uh, an important role in these areas, and they are way more than just, you know, pulling people over for speeding and, you know, traffic infractions. I mean, they, they do full-on investigations. I mean, this, this this state policeman would be taking on a detective's role of sorts, right? I mean, I honestly feel like that should just be the, you know, the general way it goes because we just have state troopers that want to give you $400 tickets. Well, yeah, and they only pull over locals. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Thanks. The state police officer, Nelaney, met with Al- uh, Alvis at the body which was nearly unrecognizable by this time. The skin was leather-like, as if the body had been there for an extended period of time, like several months. The victim was photographed and fingerprinted, but it would take hours for the medical examiner to remove the body. It was in such poor condition. At this time, forensic evidence, like DNA, wasn't really a thing, so the investigators collected what they could from the scene. Classified as a Jane Doe, the victim was taken to a medical examiner's office in Boston for autopsy. It was determined her manner of death was homicide by strangulation, and she had been outside for about nine months since winter. The woman had also been treated for a broken jaw, which was still wired. Oh, wow. A printout of 1,700, well, 1,724 missing women in Massachusetts was examined to see if anything matched the description and death time frame, but there was nothing. It could be five months before the woman was identified and before investigators would learn how wrong the medical examiner had been in establishing the time of death. Now, it's so nine months, just, you know, barely off the road, not a whole lot. That's pretty interesting. 
But uh, apparently, um, these interstates and roads are have a lot of wooded areas along the roads, kind of similar to our area. And unless you just happen to stop or have a flat or run out of gas or have a pee break, and but once you stop and get out of your car, a lot of times these um, the these bodies would be uh, readily visible if you just you know you're not speeding by, which I found very interesting. So the killer just pops off, drags a, you know dumps the body off like it's some trash, which is disgusting, and, and then they're gone and they don't want to stay there long. But uh, I just find it uh, pretty amazing that some of these discoveries, uh, they were out there that long. Well, I thought about that, Dylan, and considered the fact that, you know, most of us, when we're driving on a highway, we're not really paying attention to the wooded surroundings or what's located off the the sides of the highway, right? Um, I mean, unless you have great vision, we might come across a friend who is like, oh, did you see that? deer like 40 feet away and you're like what because <laughs> most of us you know aren't really paying attention well you're looking straight ahead basically and, uh, and typically a highway is not a place where you've got people walking so you know I, at first i was like how did you not see these bodies but then i started thinking about it and i'm like well i mean most people are not hanging out off the side of the roads right <laughs> it's true <sighs> it's just so sad well, the first body found on that hot July day was Deborah Medeiros, who had only been missing since the end of May. But her body was in such poor condition, they estimated she'd been out there for months. So that really kind of caused some confusion. Yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, I could see that being an, an honest mistake, if you will, even though a big mistake. It was on July 30th of 1988 when two guys on motorcycles called into the state police that they'd found a body off of I-90, I'm sorry, 195. <laughs> I promise I'll get my shit together. They found a body off I-95, uh, I-95, 195 westbound between Hicksville Road and Reed Road exit. The motorcyclists were two men from Fall River and had spotted the body about 15 feet down in some brush. To investigators, like the first body, the woman was nearly unrecognizable. There was no smell, no flies. It was amazing she was found at all, only a few feet away, because she was really hard to notice. The area had a narrow path, like a cut-through trail that someone might use if they wanted to take a shortcut. There was worn grass, and later one of the investigators wondered if the killer had returned to the scene several times because it was such an out-of-the-way spot for any type of walking trail. Two women were now found within the same month in brush off two highways less than 13 miles apart. Yeah, <clears throat> and you would think that instantly, because these are have a pretty specific set of circumstances even though they don't have a lot of information you know to work with that uh, you would think the cops are like hey wait a minute this is kind of weird right the second body was victim 36 year old nancy pava she was a mother of two who had been reported missing by her boyfriend it would not be officially her body would not be officially identified until december like deborah Medeiros. nancy had gone missing on july 7th of 1988 Nancy grew up in a quiet, working-class neighborhood in New Bedford with hard-working parents. I mean, her dad was really kind-hearted. Her mother was just an awesome woman. She was known to take in foster children. I mean, it sounds like Nancy had a really good life. Nancy had attended secretarial school and had always been a good student. She dreamed of becoming a nurse. Nancy married and worked a series of low-paying office jobs. Her daughters were definitely the bright spot in her life. After a divorce and a failed long-term relationship, Nancy's parents both passed away while they were just in their 50s. But those who knew the woman could pinpoint exactly when her life started to fall apart. It's when she met a man and got hooked on drugs. And that'll do it. On the day that Nancy had disappeared, she was last seen in the early morning hours near the South End looking for someone who could give her $60 to pay a fine for a bad check charge in Staunton that day. She didn't have any money, and her boyfriend would say she was hitchhiking to go see if she could get some money. Two days later, Nancy was reported missing by her boyfriend, Frankie Pina. Nancy was a heroin addict. And her boyfriend was insistent something was wrong. Nancy would not just disappear without a word, especially when it came to her children. 
Nancy had phoned her oldest daughter, Jill, on the night before she had gone missing to say she had court, no money, and it might be a while before she was able to talk again, meaning, you know, if she got sent to jail because she couldn't afford to pay this fine. It was several weeks before Nancy's family, like her daughters and sister, even learned she was missing because Frankie lied to them saying she had gone to rehab. And he said this was because, you know, he didn't really want to worry her kids. Like, hey, your mom's been missing. I don't know where she is. So he just kind of was like, oh, she went to rehab, thinking maybe she would turn back up. Well, and it's, you know, living these types of lifestyles, it's, as we all know, it's common to, you know, kind of go off the grid or, you know, have uh, spotty contact with loved ones, boyfriends, whatever, girlfriends. And uh, maybe he just thought she would, you know, turn back up. Probably. And, you know, in this case, Dylan, uh, most of these women had close relationships with their families. And so even though they were addicts, they were struggling and they were fighting their own demons, they still kept in touch with family. And that's why when they did go missing, their loved ones were very concerned because this, these were situations where they were in contact with their parents. They were in contact with their children, you know, almost every day. Now, when Nancy's sister called the police department to ask about the missing persons report, an officer told her, quote, you have to understand, junkies go missing all the time. I wouldn't worry about it. She'll show up. Yeah, and there's a, there's a problem, you know, and that happens a lot, even to this day. Exactly, Dylan. It's an attitude we hear time and time again when it comes to specific missing persons cases. At this time, New Bedford Police did not launch intensive investigations into missing persons reports, especially adults, unless there was evidence of foul play or that the person might be in danger, like maybe they had a serious medical issue. Well, it's like witnesses can be in court and have compelling, compelling testimony that where the jury is like, oh, my God, you know, this really makes sense. And then, you know, the. The, the the fence or whatever can be like, oh, did you not smoke marijuana one time in your freshman year in college? And they're like, <gasps> yeah, Perry Mason moment. And you're like, I mean, <sighs> come on, dude. Just because this person might do drugs does not change the fact that, that I... a pattern of behavior. I believe, or a petty criminal or any of that. That doesn't, I mean, you know, if you can prove uh, that they lie all the time, then that's the only thing that, you know, would be, you know, make me change my mind. But it's a, it doesn't change... But in, in those settings, it just instantly discredits people, and I don't get that. Or makes their disappearance less important right. than someone else. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't reduce their humanity. No. They deserve the same attention as anyone, right? When Nancy's sister Judy entered into the missing woman's apartment, it looked ransacked. A mattress was cut open and overturned. There were needles and syringes everywhere. A stranger's clothing was in the house, and Judy found a gun. Days later, when she went back with police, the door lock was jammed and she couldn't get in with a key. By August, her sister's household was out on the street for trash pickup, having yeah. been you know, evicted wow. at that point. If there was any evidence or information about her sister's disappearance, it was now gone. So a potential crime scene had been disassembled and piled by the street, basically. I mean, her home and all. Potentially. Right. By September, two months after Nancy went missing, there were at least four women missing from the area. All of the women were similar heights and from, or, um, sorry, from nearly the same types of backgrounds. The women had ties to Weld Square. Mary Rose Santos, Sandra Bo Botello, and Don Mendez, along with Nancy, were missing. Let's talk about Mary Santos, Dylan, or Mary Rose Santos, as she's sometimes called. A 26-year-old married mother was dropped off near the Quarter Deck Bar in New Bedford by her husband, Donald. Mary was a semi-regular for the disco night that the bar held, which sounds super fun. She told her husband she was going to hang out with some girlfriends at a nearby apartment. Mary met up with her two friends at the apartment where she did some cocaine. She then told friends she was going to work. This meant she was going to walk the streets as a prostitute to make a few fast bucks. Mary had only been working as a prostitute for a short time. Her husband had no idea she was doing this to earn money. They had met while working at a fish processing plant. So she's doing this in secret, like behind her husband's back. Well, that makes sense. Mary was new to sex work and new to the street. 
Some of the other sex workers considered her to be naive because Mary seemed to think everyone was nice and often went with men that the other women would ignore for whatever reason, whether they were just, you know, gross or they were like a known violent John. Well, it just she, she, it doesn't sound like she has street smarts. It sounds like she's found herself in this world, you know, maybe trying to feed this, uh, get extra money and without her husband knowing and she's just found herself in this world she's not she doesn't have the tools to operate in and i couldn't find information ab- about mary having an addiction um not none of my resources mm. seem to indicate that she was a drug user it almost seems that the sex work literally was just to pay the bills or to have extra money for whatever a bartender thought he'd seen mary there for most well i mean she did cocaine but it wasn't like she had an active addiction. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of contradicted myself there, but it was, I mean, it sounded more like she was a recreational user, perhaps. Right. Now, a bartender thought he had seen Mary there for most of the night, but hadn't seen her leave. It was assumed she left around 1 a.m. By 5.30 a.m., Donald was worried because his wife had not called him for a ride home. He stopped by the friend's apartment, the quarterdeck bar, and then the bartender's house before filing a missing persons report with New Bedford police. In the days that followed, Donald made up posters of his missing wife and called a local newspaper. A lawyer named Kenneth Pont helped him, and we'll talk more about Kenneth Pont later. He plays a pretty big role in the story. No one in Mary's family thought she voluntarily left town, though the owner of the quarter deck would say after having her missing post uh, missing poster up for a couple of months, there was a woman claiming to be Mary's sister who happened to be in the bar, laughed her head off and told them she had run off with a boyfriend and they were idiots for believing she was missing. So they took the poster down. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Strange. Well, well I mean, if... if- People don't typically make missing posters unless someone's truly missing. I'm right. I mean, there's not many instances I've heard of, oh, they had done this or that. They weren't really missing unless it's that dumbass woman out in California who lied to everybody about being kidnapped. Well, there's that and there's the Gone Girl movie. But Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> usually, I mean, I, I would be like, well, okay, that's your opinion, but I'm going to leave this up, this missing poster up. But it wasn't Mary's sister, and people had no idea who this random woman was, so it was just kind of odd. It was on August 11th in 1988 that 25-year-old Sandy Botello told her boyfriend of 13 years, Craig, you ain't got to lie, Craig. Um, no, she didn't tell him that. But she, <laughs> she was going to go to a friend's apartment to borrow some bread. Sandy had been dropped off by John about an hour before, and she had done some cocaine. Sandy was a serious cocaine addict, shooting up about a gram a day and hitting the streets to pay for it. The couple had two young sons, and Sandy worked Weld Square between Hathaway and Nossette Streets. She also kept regular John's names in an address book and would often take like out calls from her apartment. Her clients would say she looked like a regular woman, someone you might see coming out of a shopping mall, and described her as a real nice person caught up in a bad situation. When Craig woke up around 3 a.m. on the 12th, Sandy was not at the apartment. He woke up again at 7 a.m. and was very worried. When he phoned her friend's apartment, just like a block down the street, where she was going to go pick up a couple pieces of bread, he learned that Sandy had not made it there at all. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to go borrow the hill of bread off the neighbor's loaf. I mean, it's, uh, would you believe me if I told you I was going to borrow some bread from you the neighbor? You enjoy a good sandwich? I do. It's very plausible. I would have to mind. know what brand and quality, the quality of the neighbor's said loaf. It's right? just some white Wonder Bread. Oh, I can deal with that, too. Okay. I was in the Dollar Tree yesterday with my daughter and i was surprised at their large grocery section like all the things you could get for a dollar well now it's a dollar 25 but they had some bread and i was like oh i need some bread but then i looked at it and i was like i don't think i need that bread so they have uh food items a lot of food items and they had like a frozen food section what is that (laughs) michelinas yeah the frozen entree are they tiny they those were like a dollar 
my daughter was like pumped because they had like Snickers ice cream bars. Oh gosh! But then she didn't get it. She was like, "Oh, I want that." Uh. Yeah, I've seen a guy on a TikTok actually who uh, reviews the dollar food items from the Dollar Tree. Man, I gotta say, I've hooked myself up with some spices because you know I be loving some spices. We get a huge spice rack, and yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. And I I bought some spices there. I was in, I was like a dollar twenty five. Hell yeah, because herbs and spices is expensive. Uh, you, and that one person in there screaming about how they should change the name of the store to the dollar twenty five store and how this is bullshit. Well, no one was in there yelling that, but okay. Twenty five year old Don Mendez had an extensive arrest record for drugs and prostitution. Her mother Charlotte, a deeply religious woman, was raising Don's young son. On September 4th of 1988, Dawn was dressed in a, a pretty white dress and white gloves, heading to a christening party where her family and son would be. People at the party were not sure if Dawn would show up, but Charlotte encouraged her daughter's supervised visits with her child, despite the fact that her addiction was too severe to care for him. Dawn never showed up for the party. Charlotte would report her daughter missing pretty soon after this. There were other women who were likely at risk as well. Robin Rhodes was a New Bedford woman who had not been seen since spring and was reported missing by her mother at the end of July. A 28-year-old woman named Rochelle Dopierala, who was a witness in a gun case, and we'll talk a little more about that in a second, was from Cape Cod, was missing and also a new Bedford teenager named Christina Montiero, whose mother was engaged to a Dartmouth police officer. Christina had not been seen in months. A detective named John Dextrador was the first person who began to theorize they had a serial killer on their hands. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised it took that long, honestly. But, I mean, you know, I guess that's easy to say from our, you know, our... Monday morning recliners, but uh, I don't know. Uh, it just seems a lot of this seems really similar, you know, as they're finding these bodies along the along various interstates. He noticed patterns in the women's backgrounds. Uh, De uh, Dextrador went to the higher ups to ask that a task force be created to find the missing women, especially after two bodies were found. And at the very least, maybe they could launch a deeper investigation into the disappearance of Nancy uh, Pipe. He saw similarities in the descriptions of the missing women, where they were last seen, their drug connections, their addictions. He felt the two bodies would be connected eventually to his list of missing women. Now, eventually, Detective Dextrador... Uh, Dexter Do Doer, yeah, <laughs> met with the Bristol County District Attorney, a chief investigator, a few state troopers, and two new Bedford detectives assigned to a drug task force. He was able to lay out what he had, two suspects, and what he feared was happening, a serial killer. Now, the two suspects he tossed out were Frankie Pina, Nancy's boyfriend, the one that reported her missing, because he was kind of known as a low-life criminal. Just police knew him. He was a bit of a scumbag. So he was like a little baby shitbird in the area. I think he was a big shitbird in the area. Oh. I think he took a big shit on the area. And Kenneth Pond, the attorney who had ties to the missing women due to his cocaine habit. Now, I told you we would get back to Pond. Now, Pond is very interesting in this story. He is. Now, he was also known to have strange dealings with local hookers. Kenneth Pond had an interesting history as well. He had been sworn in as a deputy sheriff, which was mostly an honorary title, but it allowed the lawyer to serve court papers like eviction notices. And, and I'm going to get to that in a second, but I'm going to dive a little bit into him. So he had been an addict uh, like in the 60s and early 70s, was kind of known to hang out in these areas, had this massive like heroin addiction, but then got clean, went to college, went to law school. Seemingly had turned his life around, but is practicing law and actively using cocaine. Yeah, by all accounts, he wasn't no you know um, super successful lawyer, but he had gotten his shit together, and he was you know making a living as a lawyer, which is very impressive to me to 
you know, clean your act up, then go through law school, which isn't easy. No, it's really difficult. And uh, it's one of those, you know, the big three, you know, doctor, lawyer, architect. It's not easy to become any of those. And, uh, you know, and now he, he's, you know, kind of getting the respect back from the community. So uh, a lot of times he, he will, and now, he, like you said, he's now he's doing coke again. But I think he was in one of those situations where he had this reputation before, but he didn't want people to know he's using drugs again. Exactly. Right. However, Kenneth was not, um, um, he was kind of known, okay, so I'm sorry. He was known to not only serve those papers as like a sheriff's deputy, but sometimes he would flash his badge to drug dealers and then steal their drugs. I thought he was going to say he was known to win a lot of dance battles because people got served. No. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, wake it up. Dad jokes. He brought prostitutes to his home, and one of the missing women, Rochelle Dopierala, had been staying at Kenneth's home around the time she disappeared. Now, if you recall, she was supposed to testify in a gun case. So let's talk about that. This is what happened. Rochelle claimed a guy named Roger Swire had raped her. Later, Rochelle and her lawyer, Kenneth, were driving down the street when they spotted this alleged rapist. Kenneth Pomp pulls over with a gun and threatens Swire. Her lawyer. Her lawyer. Well, her friend as well, apparently. Kenneth was charged in connection with that gun incident. Rochelle was seen with Frankie Pina at Weld Square when Dex Trador asked her to testify against Kenneth. Now, by that time, she had recanted the rape allegation, but agreed to testify against Pont. It had been months since anyone had seen Rochelle around. Wow. So that one gun case that, that she may pos- you know, possibly be a witness for um, actually dra- drags all these char- connects all these characters together. It does. That's interesting. And again, because it's a small community, she's working Weld Square. She's hanging out with Nancy's boyfriend, who's, as we established, a shitbird. Suggesting New Bedford might have a serial killer was not going to be popular. It would definitely keep tourists away, and new businesses would likely review their plans to move to the city. Officials were working hard to revive the city's image, especially after the barroom rape, which had made national news only five years before. However, the Jodie Foster movie premiered in October of 1988, which would hamper those revitalization revitalization efforts. And, and this is the number one reason that I think many areas are reluctant, authorities are reluctant to say um, now, they'll always say public safety. We don't want anyone to be scared or panic. And, and that's, that's true to a degree. But th- this this reason right here is why they're so reluctant to say we might possibly it's have a serial. That's why the damn mayor wouldn't close the beaches in Amity, um, at, at Amity Beach or whatever in the fucking Jaws movie. Because he didn't want to have the tourists scared, even though the shark is out there eating people. Oh, my God. Can I, did I just figure out a way to have a great summer in Waynesville? For the locals. We have a serial killer. Ah, thank Don't you. come here. Heather's next case is about a possible serial killer in Waynesville. Don't visit. It's, uh, yeah, it's the Park of Death. Oh, the Great Smoky Mountains. There's just bodies <clears throat> piling up everywhere. Yeah, but, and I understand. Hashtag they're, misinformation. They're not, yeah, yeah, hashtag it's not true at all. Um, but they have a, you know, a, um, a duty to the community and stuff. And, and I'm not saying this is malicious on their part. But sometimes, you know, in some of the cases we, we've covered, they do go way past the point of reason. Money talks and the serial killer walks. Okay. Like that, I got dad jokes, too. Okay. I got mom jokes. After a few weeks with no movement on a task force, Dexter Doer called the newspaper to speak with a reporter who had also noticed the string of missing women. On the front page of the October 3rd, 1988 Standard Times was an article entitled Fears Build for Missing Women, which listed four missing women and their stories, including some interviews with their relatives. By late October, the official list of missing women considered um, that were considered endangered was up to six. Robin, or Bobby Lynn, Rhodes, and Christina Montiero fit the profile. Both were mothers with young children who were heroin and cocaine addicts, 
Both stayed close to the New Bedford city limits and checked in with relatives regularly. In early November, a state cleanup crew was working along the highway ramp off Interstate 195 in Dartmouth picking up cans and garbage. It was around 2 p.m. on November 8th when workers stopped in the center strip of the Reed Road Cloverleaf on the eastbound side when they saw human remains near a tree line. It was only four months earlier when those men riding motorcycles had stopped in the same area and found a body. Yeah, that's the scary part out there. About 20 or 30 feet away in the woods were clothing items. Um, There was a London fog jacket, a pair of pants, socks, underwear, and a shirt. The remains appeared to be a woman. The remains of three women found within a 20-minute drive of one another. I mean... It's yeah. like, hello, <laughs> That's I think you've got a serial killer. That's the thing. Yeah, we're past coincidence at this point, guys. And, and I'm, I'm it's striking. You may have that in your story. Uh, the the women fit a certain look. Oh, yeah. No, um, I, yeah. I kind of went in. I think I talk about that a little later on, but they definitely did, Dylan. But it's one of the most um, stark cases of that. When I've looked at the victims in, in, in a case like this, they are tend to be uh, petite. In the 110 to 130 pound range, dark features, brunettes, brunettes, brown eyes, eyes and, and just look, a, even their faces, they just look a certain way. And I'm just like, wow, that alone should be a, a major connection Mary, between victims. Mary Rose Santos is the only one who didn't exactly fit into the profile or had a, maybe a little bit different look because I think her hair was blonde or at least in the photo it looked lighter, but that could have been dyed. Right, you know exactly. What I'm saying? But she was like kind of the only one that didn't have the dark, like the really pretty dark hair. Right. Now, cadaver dogs were brought in to search the area. The first area chosen was I-195 in Dartmouth where two bodies had already been found. It, it is actually Interstate 95, baby. I-95. I said I-195. I know. That'd be another highway. Uh, okay. Well, that was what was in my notes. Well, I could be wrong, too. So, And, and, and I digress because I'm, I'm fearful of trying to correct you because you're typically right. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, highway 95. I'm sure someone will let us know, Dylan. Um, now, the first day, the dog searched for five hours but found nothing. On the second day, they searched the areas where the bodies had been previously found. The handler moved the dog to areas where there was no guardrail, which would be an easy place to pull over, where there was heavy brush or like a gully. It didn't take long for the dog to find something about 25 feet in a nearby drainage ditch. In the ditch, the dog alerted. When one of the officers bent down and reached into the mud with gloved hands, he pulled up a skeleton. Oh, my God. That's like something out of a movie. It's like a horror movie. So now they're using cadaver dogs just to randomly search this general area where these multiple bodies have already been found. Yes. In the, uh, not hopes, but in the possibility of discovering more remains. Yes. And sure enough, not that long into it, they find more remains. Pretty quickly. Obvious dumping grounds. Obvious dumping grounds. Body number four was found and the area was now a crime scene. As I mentioned before, investigators and crime scene technicians didn't have DNA to rely on in 1988. So they did spend a great deal of time trying to make sense of what they saw out in the field rather than in the lab. Blood evidence could be collected, but it was not quite the DNA technology we rely on today. And as we've noticed in a lot of these older cases, Dylan, it was like they would go off of blood type. Yeah. Which... Is not a great eliminator. No, it, it narrows it down slightly, you know. Or if you say, hey, this guy has the same blood, this suspect has the same blood type. I mean, it's more information than they used to get before. But they were actually collecting samples. Now, what they were doing with them was nowhere near what we can today or even in the you know early 2000s, late 90s. But fortunately, um, they were at least taking samples and preserving them which, you know, could be very important in the future. Investigators looked for things like tire tracks, ballistics, and types of evidence civilian chemists could uncover in a lab. Some investigators learned to look for things like bugs, bird's nests, spider webs, eggs, and tiny blood droplets. 
the body found by the dog in the muck off of the 195 ramp could potentially yield a wealth of information. Part of the body was submerged in water, but there was a hand that was not. Oh my God, that's a thing of nightmares. The victim could potentially get a fingerprint and a name, but fingerprints were still being analyzed by hand, not a computer system like we have today. So it made the work a lot harder. A technician would spend hours poring over one fingerprint card to visit, like visibly, visually compare these prints. Yeah, you can imagine two blown up fingerprints and someone with a magnifying glass searching each sector or whatever you call it of the fingerprint for similarities. And then they have to find so many to be a possible match. And this is all subjective work to a degree. As well, I'm not, I think fingerprints are a lot more, you know, a lot better science than a lot of the other things. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, like you said, someone could spend an entire day shift working on one set of prints and, and comparing them. at this time, them. they had just installed, like, a computer system that could help with this. But the issue with that was it was still new technology, and all of these counties were still uploading or trying to put the information into the system and a lot of them weren't because it was still new. And so you might have a couple counties with the system, but not all the counties. I mean, so it was just kind of a mess. Some of the cards were not readable at all because they had smudges and such. About 50% of the fingerprint cards at the time were unusable. They were not legible enough to do anything with. There were also a lot of ifs about women's fingerprints that were in the system or of these cards. Like if she had been arrested, was she printed? Because sometimes if they were arrested for some minor charge, they didn't get fingerprinted. Right. And if she had used the right name. Because some of these women would be arrested for prostitution, solicitation, drugs, and would give a fake name. So they got a fake name with fingerprints, but it's not that part, you know. Oh, my. Yeah. Oh, so wow. I, mean, it just, I, I could see that causing major issues. So it could just be chaotic. Um, I would hate to have that job. <laughs> like that would be a really stressful job to have at this time. So basically, getting a print off of some remains might help you, but it also might, very well might not help you at all to identify the victim. Exactly. At this point, state and local police have mapped out a strategy for investigation. New Bedford police assigned four detectives to the case full time, and they brought on Douglas Ubelaker a forensic anthropologist from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., to help identify the four victims. It was on December 1st of 1988 that the cadaver dog and her handler were wrapping up a search of Route 140 near Freetown when the dog found something in the woods. It was body number five. Oh, my gosh. Deborah Lynn McConnell, age 25, was last seen in May of 1988. She was from Newport, Rhode Island. We were just there talking about the Von Bulos. Um, her father had last seen Deborah when she had shown up to her mother's burial at a cemetery. So her mother had just passed away. When she was discovered, um, her body was nude, but she had a bra around her neck, like our first victim, Deborah Madero's. Her family knew something was wrong when she didn't call or show up for her daughter's birthday. She came to her mom's funeral and then just vanished. So, again, it's one of those cases. She may be doing her own thing, but still stays in contact with her family and children. And as I mentioned before, the remains of all five victims were so badly decomposed that identification was difficult. I mean, they have these bodies, but most of them don't get ID'd until, like, December. Yeah. So it, you got like months of this going on. And even uh, cause of death was uh, subjective in some of these cases because the remains were in such a poor state. So one of these victims will be ID'd as Don Mendez. Mendez disappeared while en route to a christening at the Brick and Wood Housing Project in the north end of the city. Her body was found on November 29th alongside Interstate 195. Now, Brick and Wood Housing Project plays a major role in this case. A housing complex for low-income residents was also the home to missing woman Sandy Botello. Sandy's apartment was next door to Shirley Montiero, mother of Christina Montiero, who had been missing since June the 7th. 
Christina was alleged to have a cocaine habit, much like Sandy and Craig. Uh, Andre, Andre Day, <laughs> who I'm is sh- Sandy's boyfriend. I'm sure you said that. I'm right. just going to call him Craig. Just call him Craig. Craig. Now, describe Craig because Craig knew her, and he described Christina as, quote, a sister to us. Montiero was reportedly working as a prostitute in Weld Square to support her drug habit. So we have three missing women who will later be named as murder victims who have ties to both Weld Square and the Brick and Wood Housing Project. Craig said he also knew Mary Rose Santos, who went missing from the Quarterman Bar. I mean, so these people, they they all have these connections. Well, yeah, and like you said, it just speaks on the close-knit community, small kind of small-town vibe of the area. Also, a woman named Marilyn Cardoza Roberts was said to be a neighbor of Christina Montiero. And we'll get to her story here in a moment. Now, eventually, the fifth victim will be identified as Deborah DeMello. A woman with a history of drug problems, DeMello was known to local law enforcement, having spent time in prison. There was no official missing persons report filed for Deborah DeMello, but after a description was released to the press... Of this victim, a caller phoned in with a tip that it sounded like a woman named Deborah DeMello. So Deborah was the mother of three and had been plagued by drug addiction since she was a young teenager. She had been serving a 21-month sentence in the Women's Correctional Institute in Cranston for loitering and prostitution in Providence, Rhode Island. On June 18th, she failed to show up at the prison following a day of work release at a supply company. So you're saying she was standing around selling that thing? Well, she was, and she was arrested and jailed. Okay. Right? And so then she's in jail, and they allow her work release. Okay. But she just doesn't come back from that. Oh, man. So she's, like, become a fugitive from justice. But we trusted you. <laughs> she's become a fugitive with that thing, Dylan. So she run off. Run off. So DeMello had escaped from prison at the time of her death. In 1986, she was arrested for being a fugitive from justice stemming from other drug charges. So she had a history also of just, you know, peacing out. Yeah, absconding. Yeah. And kind of blowing off, and it's like, whatever, and... and if they get me again, I'll just run off again. Right. So she wasn't filed as a missing or per- missing person. She was considered a fugitive absconding. Right. So there, it's not abnormal for her not to surface because she's hiding out from charges. Right. So they didn't even have her listed as a missing person. Now, eventually, investigators are able to identify the first four victims using dental records. So we've got Deborah Madero, Safal River, Nancy Pava, and Don Mendez of New Bedford. And the fourth body was identified as Rochelle Dopierala. Wow. Remember, she was the one staying with the lawyer. That was a pretty name. Another missing woman was the daughter of a retired police officer, Marilyn Cardoza Roberts. I just mentioned she was a neighbor in this brick and wood housing project. Now, in her 20s, Marilyn had begun using drugs, and her parents spent thousands of dollars trying to get her sober. By the end of her 20s, Marilyn seemed to kick a heroin habit, married a fisherman. Life seemed to to be going well for her, until she met a man named Raul Yero. I don't trust Raul at all. I don't either. Who was the biggest heroin dealer in New Bedford. Soon, Marilyn was using heroin and cocaine, getting arrested with Raul in a drug raid in 1985, When spring rolled around and Marilyn's mother didn't hear from her daughter in March, which was her mother's birthday, and then no one had heard from Marilyn by Mother's Day, they were worried. Rumors circulated that she had stolen about $25,000 worth of jewelry from Raul and headed south to New Jersey. Her name was never posted as a missing person, but a local police detective kept an eye out for her. Like, every time he would be out doing patrols or walking around the square, he would ask about her because, you know, he knew her dad. He knew she had been missing. And, you know, there were all these stories. Oh, she's ran off. She went down south. She went to New Jersey. So he was just kind of, I guess, kind of because he had known her growing up, was just trying to keep an eye out for her. But noted she was missing. 
And he may be thinking, hey, it's just connected to well, this other... Well, see, there's that too. ...other goings because on. Because it is assumed she became a victim of the new Bedford Highway killer, but her body has never been located. She is one of... There's only two women that have never been found, and she's one of them, you know, in theory. A woman in 1987 had claimed a guy with dirty blonde hair and scars on his face driving a white pickup truck had pulled up to her in Weld Square. She had a few usual spots, which she considered a safe place for John's. But instead of taking her to these places, she suggested this guy hit the highway and told her to just do what I say. He got off an exit in Dartmouth near where the bodies would later be found. She ran from him, but was eventually caught. The man dragged her into a ditch, raped her, and had a knife stuck in the ground right by her head the whole time. Oh, my God. She fought back, eventually was able to grab her clothes and take off running. Months later, she will see him again in Weld Square and jot down his license plate number, which she turned over to police. So the man was 35-year-old Neil Anderson, who lived not far from the square with his mother and had a lengthy criminal record. He was charged with raping a hitchhiker back in July of 1988. So not long around the same time that he you know attacked this other woman when state police searched his home get this dylan they found a wide array of curious items like a fillet knife ammunition brass knuckles a hatchet a switchblade a whip a whip and some clothing that you know probably belonged to a lady he was indicted for a third rape near the eastern section of fall river um, that locals called the reservation. He would become one of many suspects that police would investigate, but then later set aside due well, to the, lack of evidence. Well, at the very least, he, he's a the, serial fucking rapist. He's a serial rapist, and I think that is that is horrible. Fucking scumbag. Yeah. Bird. Investigators hit the streets asking the sex workers about peculiar clients or anyone who seemed sketchy. Some of the men's names who came up were men of power, men who should know better, picking up prostitutes off the streets. At least that's how the district attorney viewed these men, right? Married men, men of status, wealth, privilege. And because there was a huge, uh, like, you know, HIV Pandemic, yeah, this basically, was yeah, this know, was during epidemic. the hot of that. Yeah, yeah, um, and there was a lot of HIV and AIDS in this area because of the drug use and the prostitution. That the DA was just like, "How you know this is a problem? Like, why are you out doing this?" But anyway, many of those men began calling the district attorney's office to make sure their secrets weren't exposed. Yeah, like I'll tell you what I know or might have seen, but don't, you know, keep my name out your mouth. Yeah. Much like Will Smith's wife. They were advised by the district attorney to cooperate. The investigators were trying to solve murders, not expose their sexual proclivities to the public. No, it's funny, though, is anytime they inv- investigate victims tied to these types of activities, it doesn't take long for this very thing to come out. People. With you know reputations in town, the powerful, whatever, because we all know there's a reason it's the oldest profession in the world, sex work, because people are gonna get theirs, and when you break it down to a straight up monetary transaction for services provided, it has been going on as long as humankind has been together. I have two responses to that. Yeah, the words of Lauren Hill. That thing, that thing, that thing. Oh my God! And that also, thing, honestly. Um, in the words of Naughty by Nature, OPP. That's true. That could also be other people's property. Which, Are you down with it? Which could be that thing. Are you down with OPP? Um. Well, not now. Wait, wasn't that also like a clothing line? Ocean Pacific? Was it OPP? That was just OP. It was OP. Oh, man, I want to. I wish I had an Ocean Pacific vintage shirt right now. If anybody is I out there. I some OP. Oh, God, that was my jam. In the 80s. And I still could, didn't have enough of it. If anybody, right quick, if anybody's in a thrift store anywhere around the world. And you see a fat man's Ocean Pacific. And you see a, a, a 3X OP shirt. 
send that to me. I would pay triple what you paid. Big Daddy wants a shirt with like a surfer on it. Just some random generic surfer with sunglasses. I remember having a really badass OP shirt that had like these kind of stripes across oh the God. chest with like a sailboat. And it was like ocean Pacific. So many pastels and, and like blues. Oh man, that was, I loved that shit. Oh, I would wear like my OP shirt with like my jams. Oh my God. My brightly colored jams. <laughs> Not your they. jellies. Yeah, I had some jelly too much and, and some pink Reeboks. Oh my god! Okay, Shoo, high, gosh. high top pink Reebok. We need to start like an eighties nostalgia I was rocking podcast. Rocking the first grade. I have an eight. I had an eighties nostalgia podcast, and I listened all the time. You need to get back to it. Well, some steam there. Okay, back to my story. So the women who worked Weld Square didn't fit the Hollywood image of a sex worker. They wore jeans, t-shirts, tennis shoes. If a person glanced at them, they simply looked poor, but a closer look might reveal that they had a drug addiction. Many of them kept tabs on dangerous clients. They would write down license plate numbers and felt they could usually spot a John who might rob or beat them up. Well, they're just trying to protect themselves and their associates and friends. Some of the women carried knives or screwdrivers for for protection, but most of them knew deep down that once she was inside of John's vehicle, they had no idea what could really go down. Before the bodies turned up in 1988, Fall River had several sex workers killed in 1987. Peggy Nunez and Darcy Danielson had been killed that year. There was a third woman found near the waterfront named Joanne Andrade, same last name as Craig. So we'll just call her Joanne. And then two unsolved murders of women who had left bars and ended up dead. So it was dangerous on the streets before 1988, but that's really when the violence seemed to come on like full speed. With six bodies, it was unlikely that the other missing women would be found alive. One named kept coming up in interviews with the girls on the streets, relatives of the missing women, and even a few cops. And that was Kenneth Pont. Damn it, Kenneth. The lawyer. He had represented Mary Rose Santos in a civil case and even helped her husband distribute missing persons posters. Don Mendez, who was last seen in September, had been to his home before. And Rochella, uh, Rochelle Dopierala was seen in his car and was known to stay at his house. Robin Rhodes, who had also been missing since the spring, told her sister she was dating a lawyer she called Kenny. Nancy Pava had once worked in his neighborhood video store and had hired him for a bankruptcy case. So Kenny's just all around connections. He has a lot of connections to these women. He was known to be a heavy cocaine user, and girls on the street told investigators he was paranoid. He would bring them to his house, then bolt the doors and refused to let them leave. He wasn't violent with the sex workers, but just really strange, well, know, odd behavior. I know what Kenny was doing. He was all in the blinds, like looking to see if anyone's on the street, if someone's out there. He's like just, uh, yeah, he's t he's tweaking. He's, he's the cocaine version of tweaking. And I don't like people that do that because you're ruining my buzz, bro. I'm just trying to chill. This didn't stop the girls from going with him, though. Um, he supplied them with cocaine and wasn't really interested in sex. So even though he acted, you know, in a really odd way, they were like, well, I don't have to touch him and he's going to hook me up. Well, and he wasn't violent. No. He wasn't mean to them. He was just doing his thing. And, and I, you know, yes, I did use drugs back in the day, but I don't now. I must have a full disclaimer there. Yeah, but uh, We know, Dylan. <laughs> I know exactly. We know. Um, some drugs, not all. Uh, I know exactly how Kenny was acting, and uh, but at the same time, um, and, and it seems to me like uh, he's just he's friendly. These are his friends as well. You know, you become cl close to people. You run around this, doing the same activities together, and, and sometimes he would send them out to get him the cocaine and stuff and bring it back to him. Now that's he, exactly what it was. He doesn't he, want to be seen. He was procuring. Uh, well, he was using these sex workers to procure the drugs. Right. Because you're right. He had a reputation that he had, like, cleaned up his act, and he didn't want people knowing that he was still snorting the coke. Gosh, I bet it was good coke. Will you stop? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Everybody's here, you know, listen to you all these times, and they're like, damn, Dylan. I'm kidding. I'm sure it was. Who are you, Pablo Escobar? No, and don't do cocaine, kids. If, if you're in the car listening to this with your kids, do not do cocaine. Dare? 
Keep you, kids off drugs. You're not exactly, and you're not going to be able to find this great '80s Coke nowadays. No, it's probably going to have fentanyl. It's going it. to have fentanyl, on it and you're going to die. Yeah. So that's why you don't do drugs. Yeah. So why don't you sit over there? And okay. Get somewhere and get still. So done. here's Kenny. He's all over the place. He's connected to various uh, people in, in multiple ways in some cases, and so I've got to imagine that the cops know about Kenny. Well, yeah, they're asking these sex workers, and so yeah. Yeah, so they, I mean, I know. I got to. I might, I might imagine that some of the investigators might like him a lot for the, the possibly being, you know, their killer. On October tenth of nineteen eighty eight, Pont packed up his home and office, moving to Florida about a month after Don Mendez went missing. He had bought a place in Fort Ritchie in August. A number of people said the move to Florida was no surprise that he had been planning it for some time, but others said the move was abrupt. No other women went missing from the streets after Kenneth Pomp moved out of New Bedford. Wow. Just saying. That's interesting. After he moved, investigators did a search of his old office, but didn't turn up any information. Then out of nowhere, Pomp called the district attorney's office asking, am I a suspect? Investigators had really tried to keep this search on the down low, Pont admitted to knowing some of the victims, but threw around some theories that perhaps it was someone from the Coast Guard killing the women. Okay. It's kind of random. <laughs> Maybe it's that guy on the boat out so there. So many coast, Coasties out there. Yeah. Just wearing a little orange life vest. and. I mean, it makes sense. Just doing I, some killing. I sat up for four days and I thought about this. <laughs> Damn it, Kenny! Put they're out there doing rescues in the water, but then they're yeah on the shore. But they're not really rescuing them; they're doing a crime, killing them. Yeah, I mean, come on, come on, Kenny, calm down. <laughs> Can we come up with something better than <laughs> it's a coast guardsman? Okay, December tenth of nineteen eighty eight, two squirrel hunters alerted law enforcement that they had discovered a body, and that was Rochelle, and she had actually been beaten to death, unlike the other women who were mostly strangled. So her victim profile or you know cause of death i mean it was just a little different so yeah, that's what i was sets her right apart yeah like two of the victims was obvious strangulation by ligature you had the bra around the neck in one case and i forget what the other one is and then the other victims the remains were not in a good state um i think they assumed you know the hell they're in the same area well, yeah i mean they same, didn't have you know it, it was they like assumed they, they were strangled marks really right on their bones yes you know sometimes there there's the markings that someone's been stabbed there weren't any bullet holes gunshot exactly know, like gun, no other you know, violence nothing like that so they assumed these women all death died. by strangulation now the body of mary rose santos will be discovered in march 1989 along route 88 in westport she had been strangled Robin Rhodes was found in March of 1989 off Route 140 in Freetown. She had been strangled. It won't be until April 24th of 1989 that Sandy Botello will be found in the woods off Interstate 195 in Marion. Sandy had also died from strangulation. So as you see, all fit the same profile. Rochelle is the only kind of outlier in the situation. Now this is in a fairly quick time frame as far as murders and bodies being found go is that correct from july of 88 they start finding bodies up until april of 1989 <laughs> so basically 12 months yep wow that's a lot i mean that's a that's uh, in, in our true crime minds we think about cooling off periods and things well this person this perpetrator this serial killer did not have extended cooling off periods no. because these women went missing and it's presumed they were killed probably quickly after they were taken. Right. And they all kind of went missing like right there, you know, boom, boom, boom with just a matter of a couple months. Yeah. Even sometimes a couple of missing in, in the same month. So this guy's like fucking busy. This is crazy. Yeah, it's a lot. How many victims in, in in that short period of time? It's like this fucking monster just out there preying on women. Christina Montiero and Marilyn Cardoza Roberts are the only suspected victims whose remains have yet to be recovered to this day. I find it interesting that they are also the two women who had ties to local cops. Oh, wow. Because Montero's mother was engaged to a Dartmouth police officer. And if you remember Marilyn Cardoza Roberts, her father was a retired cop. Yep. 
There were other murders, and investigators wondered if there was a link. So in Providence, eight women, all, all of them but one, prostitutes, had been killed since 1978. Some were strangled like the victims in New Bedford. Four other women were killed in New Bedford, all seen leaving local bars between 1986 and 1988. So could it be the same killer? There were the killings of prostitutes across the country, what we know today as the Green River killings in Washington State. Then the White River Junction killings, where nine bodies were found on the Vermont-New Hampshire border. There were also sex workers found near Waterbury, Connecticut. So cops were just like scrambling around, theorizing, you know, these cases could potentially be connected, trying to do a little bit of investigative work into those cases to see if they matched what was happening in New Bedford. Could they have ties? You have a little bit more information on some of these murders, though. Yeah, I have a little bit about uh, the Waterbury and the White River Junction uh, incidents. And what 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 uh, struck me as interesting with those, because as you said, it was happening all over the country, uh, literally, uh, was the proximity of these areas to New Bedford. Yes. Uh, Waterbury to New Bedford is about 150 miles, two and a half hour drive, easily done in a day if you, if you were so inclined. Or right? someone who lives in one area and yes. moves for a job or something. Yes, and, and just a few you know hours away. In the case of Waterbury, now Waterbury seems rather interesting to me, okay. as far as, uh, and so you have uh, you have three vi- three main victims, um, starting in 1988. Karen Everett, her bo- her remains were uh, discovered, and she was obviously strangled, according to reports. And then in 1989, Mildred Alvarado was her remains were discovered and obviously strangled. And then in 1993. Well, that's about, you know, four years later, big period. Evelyn Bentoncourt was found, but she was shot, which I always find interesting when the MO changes up. And, and actually, um, some years later, or some time later, Michael W. Curry Jr. confessed to shooting Evelyn five times and that she was pregnant and that he was doing it kind of like a copycat style. So we can, unfortunately, that's horrible what happened to Evelyn, obviously. So you can remove her out of it. But, um, but in a situation like this, there could potentially be other women who've just never been found. Well, right? there's, there's that. And see, this, this was in the Har- Harwington Forest area where all these remains were found. Okay. And, and, but I also thought, hey, that's um, a, an extension of the cooling off period to a degree. But like, like you said, there could be three other victims in, in these periods that we don't know about. So maybe he wasn't cooling off. And, and, and then in and the, to be dumped in like a forest area, it's right. not off a highway, but it's still very similar. similar. And, you know, if these now what years did these murders happen? Uh, the first one was in 88, 89. And then ninety three, which we're going to, okay, for the sake of argument, remove Evelyn right um, from well, it because it was well, it seemed to be that happened so close to the the time of the New Bedford. I'm not sure if they're really tied in, but my thought is this: if they had happened potentially earlier, a killer might have gone to great lengths to hide these women's bodies in like this forested area, and then changed up his uh, dumping grounds because it was like too much effort. I mean, it takes a lot to get a body out in a secluded area well and that was the thing uh, i actually listened to an interview on a podcast called crawl space which was a great co- i might actually start listening it's a great um, great interview with the author of yeah, the book a ton of people love crawl space yeah I oh it's a big deal around quite a bit and uh, so it was a great interview with the author of the book shallow grave yeah, maureen boyle and she was talking about um you know it's, it's some people's thought was hey we got an interstate uh, long haul trucker killing people, right? Because it's all right off Which makes a lot of sense. Right off highways, uh, I ninety five, uh, Route one forty, and Route eight, which was kind of interconnected through all these cases. And so, yeah, that. But she pointed off through extensive research and going to the locations. A lot of these are in very uh, secluded, uh, hard to get to uh, two lane roads where a, a long haul rig. A full on eighteen wheeler and trailer is not going to go. Is a not going to go? Yeah. B going to be very noticeable. People are. It's going to stand out because you don't typically see these types of rigs up these roads. 
So in her mind, the, the likelihood of it being some kind of a long haul trucker was uh, very low, right? I agree, especially with it with all these victims coming from New Bedford. I mean, just having knowledge of long haul truckers and kind of how that works. This seems to me like someone who picked these women up in a normal sized vehicle. Uh, her thoughts were honestly, it's a local. He knows no, the well, area. That's what I think. He knows the drug scene. He knows the the prostitution scene, and he knew where he would, you know, pick his victims. See, that's exactly what I think. And I agree completely. Yeah. Now, what struck me as strange with the White River Junction killings, which is, uh, it's about three hours from New Bedford, 185 miles. Um, It's crazy, because we're talking seven plus victims from 78 through 1987. Yeah, I think I my number that I reported here was nine. Yeah. So... Yeah, but, again, this is what always gets me. Okay. The M.O.s, they were all stabbed. So we're talking either a killer who's trying to figure out what 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 he likes, what gets his jollies off, or a completely separate incident. But, I I mean, my God, you're talking seven to nine victims over, uh, what, uh, less than ten years. So I think at some point we may have to talk about the White River Junction killings and is also known as the Connecticut River Valley Killer. Oh, well, honey, we covered that. Oh, yes, we did. Uh, oh, gosh, we did that in the little <laughs> montage episode, didn't we? We did an, a whole episode about okay. the Connecticut River Valley. Okay. This well, is probably there why you, you shouldn't have been doing drugs back in the day. Well, see, that's why drugs are bad, kids. See what happens to your brain. So uh, I don't think, uh, honestly, uh, White River Junction is this possibly connected. But I must say, in a Waterbury sex worker slangs... Um, those two murders in 88 and 89 could potentially could be. potentially be our like killer. We might have discussed those murders when we talked about the Connecticut River Valley killer. Um, but maybe not. I'm not sure. Well, it's just. But uh, it does seem very coincidental. And being in such a close area, only 150 miles, it could be very similar. somebody who lived and then moved to this other area or had family in Waterbury or traveled some for work went there and yeah did this deed I mean I don't know I, That's wouldn't, the, I wouldn't rule it out this is what got me thinking like my god they they potentially either have a prolific you know killer killing all around the area or at the very least they have multiple killers victimizing all these women and dumping them out like them trash it's like scary. this it is horrifying Tips poured in from a teenage girl who claimed she was abducted, punched, and thrown out of a car off of 195 to stories of a truck driver who picked up a woman and had thrown her out of his truck near Warwick, Rhode Island. So, yeah, this is a very dangerous area for these women. Another suspect to emerge was in May of 1989. Anthony DeGrazio was a 26-year-old construction worker and frequent visitor of Weld Square. He was called flat nose by the sex workers because of his oddly shaped nose. Apparently, it was kind of like really close to his face. So he had a flat nose. So that's what they called him. Well, that's uh, like a damn mobster name or some shit. I know, right? <laughs> DeGrazia had attacked a woman named Margaret Medeiros, attempting to strangle her. He was connected to 17 alleged attempted rapes and assaults on sex workers in the Weld Square area. Well, okay, again, here we have this guy who's obviously, at the very least... Uh, violence towards women constantly. Why is this guy on the street? Women. How many times do you have to rape a woman or try to rape a woman before you're put in freaking jail? Well, we know how that goes. God, it pisses me off. I know. It's some bullshit. It's done on purpose. Women were warned to stay away from him because of his behavior, which included trying to strangle several prostitutes after raping them. Margaret Medeiros testified before a grand jury, but they failed to indict him. He eventually surrenders himself and spends about 13 months in jail awaiting trial before being released due to a lack of evidence. He told one of the sex workers, quote, I'm going to do to you what I did to the others. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's ominous. One month after his release in July of 1990, DeGrazia is found dead by his ex-girlfriend's parents. He is lying face down under a picnic table, I believe in their backyard, and was thought to have died by suicide. Reportedly, pills were found. Well, uh, you know, by his body. That is an improvement in the story because this guy was a piece of shit who attacked women left and right. 
and no evidence has really been found to link him to the murders. However, his family believes he was murdered. An autopsy report ruled his death as a homicide, but the district attorney's office changed it to a suicide. I did not think that the district attorney's office could overrule the coroner. Well, typically they don't, Dylan. Uh, Degrazzi's mother filed a lawsuit against the DA's office, specifically since they named him as their top suspect, but had no evidence to tie him to the murders. And because of this suicide. Oh, it's like ruling. they did. Since they had put him on the radar as a possible suspect, like they didn't. That's weird. I, I, their motivation there, I, I don't quite understand. In August of 1990, Kenneth Pont is indicted by a grand jury in the murder of Rochelle. The district attorney suggested that Pont had beaten the woman to death over a blackmail plot involving that gun case. He was arraigned on the murder charge in September and posted a $50,000 bond. He entered a plea of not guilty. In July of 1991, all charges against Pont are dropped, again, due to a lack of evidence. In 2009, police excavated part of Pont's former driveway and patio in New Bedford. On the morning of May 15, 2009, he was arrested for shoplifting four cans of sardines and some cheese from a Price Right store. Damn, Kenny. Now, that with them uh, uh, taking, there was rumors for an extended period of time that he had, I guess, uh, constructed this patio at some point when, when before he moved to Florida. And, and for quite some time, uh, the DA's office of prosecution wanted to go do a proper search of this property. And obviously that's not always uh, possible. And so then he packs up, moves to Florida. And uh, then it turns out the bank is actually in control of the property. So the DA reach, reaches out to the bank like, hey, this is the deal. Do you mind if we go, you know, kind of uh, hammer up this patio? And they're like, yeah, okay, eventually agreeing. And, uh, and nothing was found. But, but that is strange. That rumor persisted to the degree to make investigators go tear up a damn, you know, concrete slab. Well, let's be honest, Dylan. Anytime you're watching a true crime New show construction in the yard. Or listening <laughs> to a podcast and you find out a person of interest, a suspect, has built a swimming pool. Yeah. Put up a new building. A marble statue. A, with a big a base. concrete patio, <laughs> poured new cement in their garage. I mean. My God, we I, we thought Brian Laundry may be living under a flower bed in his mom's backyard. So, I mean, that's the way we think, right? That's true. That was his hand, damn it. I swear it was. <laughs> he was found dead in his home on January 27th of 2010. Oh, my gosh. So, Pont has passed away. The new Bedford Highway killer case went cold with no new leads and no new suspects. However, in Lisbon, Portugal, a strange pattern began to emerge similar to the one in New Bedford. Someone was killing sex workers at alarming rates. Between 1992 and 1993, three prostitutes were killed that we know of. Yeah, this is very interesting. On July 31st of 1992, 22-year-old Maria Valentina was found in a cabin in, I'm going to butcher it, Povoe de Santo Adreo in a pool of blood. Let's just say in Lisbon. Yup. Okay. She had been strangled, disemboweled, and some of her organs had been removed. It was an absolutely horrific, brutal murder it's she was bu butchered awful, like an animal like jack the ripper type of shit ah. a second victim 24 year old maria fernanda was found in january in a cabin by some railway workers she had also been disemboweled with organs removed then a third victim 27 year old maria uh, hoeo was found near the first victim who happened to be her friend and she was killed in the same manner as the others all victims were young, brunette, and alleged sex workers and drug addicts, which totally matched the description of nearly all the murders in New Bedford. In March of 1993, FBI agents arrived in Lisbon with information about the American murders. They theorized the killer was a member of the Portuguese community in New Bedford. He had left the city and traveled back to Portugal. However, no real connection was ever made. Other sex workers were killed in similar fashions in the Netherlands, Czech Republic, Belgium, and Denmark, which led investigators to theorize the killer might have been a long-haul trucker. 
or an international traveler <laughs> or um see okay so the this is crazy the the Lisbon Ripper is very the in, Lisbon Ripper the Lisbon is, is Ripper what he was dubbed and but the, I must say again that that seems to be a significant difference in the you know the aftermath of the remains and the mo because obviously this part, whoever was killing these poor women enjoyed the cutting them up and stuff. Well, let's think about it. If he's evolving as a killer, that's true. He's first to strangling them, then when he goes back home to Portugal, he ups the ante. It's the strangling, and then I'm going to disembowel you. Uh, and that's that's quite possible. And, and figures out that that he really you know enjoys that element of it. Now, so you got this uh, large Portuguese population in the area of New Bedford in New England period, because uh, as you said earlier, the welling industry uh, y- years and years ago, and there was also after the welling industry the textiles. And these uh, low skilled jobs, there were, were plentiful. And, and that's not to say uh, an immigrant is dumb. But if you go to an, uh, if I was to go to Mexico right now, didn't speak the language, didn't have any family co- or friend connection, I'm not going to want a complicated job. I'm going to want an easy, low skilled job, right? Well, you've got communication so, barriers. So, yeah, so I can get by, right? And so there, that's this is what exactly. brought so many for. Uh, decades so many portugal uh immigrants to this area or they would do three or four runs back in the day with a welling fleet and then they would uh, oftentimes just stay well it's over. the same with any immigrant yeah yeah and, so I mean, you know when the irish right. came it was kind of a similar situation so um, to this day uh, as much as 55 percent of uh, the population of the area claims uh, portugal roots at least you know half Amer- you know half whatever half portugal and the only other state, Portuguese. yes, Portuguese. Sorry, I'm sorry to all our Portuguese listeners. Stephanie's probably yelling at you right now. She is. I'm <laughs> sure she has yelled at me more than once in this episode. And it's second only to California as far as the population goes. So the only reason I'm saying that is because uh, it's interesting that the authorities from Portugal would come over for that very reason. And and, and it's a good theory on it was their actually part. Actually, Americans who went over there. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, it is interesting that they would maybe consider, hey, this guy's killed all these people well, here. it seems like a pretty solid right. theory or solid connection, considering, I mean, when you're working with nothing, you have no real suspects, you have no real right. evidence, you're just like totally, hey, this is a cold case. I mean, I, you're grasping at straws, and this seems like a pretty decent straw. Right. Yeah, and, and I think it show, proves to what lengths uh, the investigators went to solve this. To case. solve this, yeah. even at some point they got a profile from uh, the famous the, the mine hunter crew, and uh, I think maybe they expected uh, more like a smoking gun. This is where you're going to find your guy, but obviously it's just a general profile who you might be looking what for. What was their profile? Do you remember? That I did not get exposed to the act. Um, the details in the profile, but uh, the the author did say they were kind of disappointed. Maybe they expected uh, it to help them more. Oh, yeah. Well, just because that was such a bit, that was still such a big new thing, you know, at that point. Exactly. But uh, they just uh, gave them some. Uh, Sometimes they're pretty vague. Well, and pro- that's what profiles do. You know, they just give you a general outline. And if you already have some uh, handful of suspects, you can say, hey, this guy right here fits, you know, two or three or four of those six points, you know. So uh, they did. They they tried. They tried for a very long time. And uh, so where does that leave us now? Well, yeah, I mean, just as far as a profile goes, and I'm no profiler. I'm just a true crime podcaster. It's true. But know enough about true crime to speculate that this guy was a local. And typically serial killers kill within their own community. Yes. Uh, their own race, typically. So yes. I would speculate this is a local guy and that he's part of this Portuguese community. I think he very well could have been. And knew... Probably knew these women personally, had known them from school or just around the neighborhood. Or was part of the drug scene and or prostitution possibly, scene. Exactly. And was possibly familiar with these women so he could get them in the car. They trusted him enough to go with him. Even if the other women, because they were looking out, or sex workers, I should say, um, uh, they were looking out for each other. 
maybe they did if they even if they saw him around he was familiar well, see that's the thing is they didn't there was not anything really about him maybe that tipped them off that this guy's dangerous because he was like oh well we know charlie or Larry he has or, that mask exactly that he can lower down so and, and, that would just be my theory and no one would ever suspect that uh so and so would do this and when he did let that monster out that will you you didn't survive but then who am i i'm just a fucking true i think we just so uh, i think we just got it i think we just need to go up here and i need to do some detective work okay so uh how so i'm not done yeah bring this home bitch I ain't done no you got it be silent Okay, so another suspect named Daniel Tavares Jr. was serving time for murdering his mother when he sent a letter to prison staff claiming that he had been responsible for the serial killings in New Bedford. In 1991, Daniel had stabbed his mother Anne to death 16 times in their Somerset home with a carving knife. My God. He had also um, some knowledge of another murdered woman, Gail Botello, who was found buried under a tree in his backyard. She had gone missing in 1988. Her murder was allegedly over a cocaine debt, according to Tavares. He was also charged with murdering Brian and Bev Muak, who were neighbors in 2007. He had only been released from prison for about five months when he shot and killed this couple in Washington. Damn, Washington so State. he's a killer for sure, huh? Yeah, and there was some back and forth between the victim's families in Washington and the state of Massachusetts. Like you released this fucking murderous piece of shit. And even though he's like on probation, he moves to Washington. Y'all aren't like extraditing him. Yeah. And then here five months later, he murders this couple. That's crazy. It was, I think over $50. That, that's a failure of the system. Um, well, he claimed that they owed him like $50, but when they found him, they think he was trying to burglarize this couple's house because he, I guess, had some maybe equipment or tools or something that made pe the police think that he had tried to break in their house and they were there and he killed them. Yeah, he had a bag marked breaking kit. <sighs> I find the New Bedford case similar to the Long Island or Gilgo Beach serial killer case, oh, and I'll yeah. explain to you why. Yes. So there are certainly some differences, but all the victims are similar profiles. They are drug users who engage in sex work. Also, Dylan, the Long Island serial killer began in the 1990s. When, I mean, this is all shortly after these unsolved murders in Massachusetts. So it's likely this person did these crimes in New Bedford and then moved on and maybe murdered some other people somewhere else and then could go to this Gilgo Beach area and start dumping these bodies. Because remember, they were dumped. Oh my God, the dude. And in those and brambles. They were strangled. Yes. Um, and just some of the differences, like, you remember, like, the burlap sack was a thing? Yeah. But it's very similar. Wow. And, and that's unsolved. Yeah, well, that's another similarity. Able to do it, be proficient, do it right under the community's and that nose. kind of right? like boom, boom, boom. Remember, I mean, yeah. there were some bodies that were found, like, in the late 90s and then the early 2000s, but it seemed kind of like there wasn't a ton of cooling off period. No. With this guy. Wow. That seems like a stronger possibility than the other two we discussed. Cha-ching. Damn. New Bedford police have always operated on the idea that the suspect was local who knew the area well and likely knew the sex workers from either Weld Square or perhaps the housing project. Totally makes sense to me. Yeah. Although the case remains unsolved, there are 15 children who deserve to know what happened to their mothers. So hopefully with advances in DNA technology and... This focus on cold cases, because a lot of police departments now that we have this more advanced, um, like forensic methods, are reopening these cases. We may see this case solved sometime soon, hopefully. Yeah, and I believe even uh, even recently that some of these items, some of these collected samples, are you know being uh, sent with new techniques or being exposed to new techniques as we speak. Well, coincidentally, Dylan, as I am researching and typing up this story, I found an article that was written like that particular day when working on this case. Uh -uh. So like a brand new article written about um, these unsolved murders in and around New Bedford and how 
uh, you know, there's a cold case kind of team or whatever looking into these cases, and some of the victims are, they were mentioned. So I'm hoping, because this is a new article, that they really are taking the time to reopen these cases and do maybe more thorough investigative work or whatever. I know what's going to do it. Familial, Familial DNA. Familial DNA. That's what's going to crack it, guys. So today's sources, Shallow Graves by Maureen Boyle. Thanks, Stephanie, for sending us a copy. And the Rhode Island Monthly had an article from April of 2009 that was very informative. Reports from the Boston Globe, the Boston Herald, and a website called murderinnewengland.org. Yeah, and I, I read, uh, once you put me on, on some homework, I, I read multiple articles from the Boston Globe and I uh, um, listened to a great episode of Crawl Space, a great podcast. And, uh, well, I think a lot of people know that. I'm just now figuring it out. But it was a great interview. And, and uh, what was her name? Sh- is it Cheryl? What? The author? Maureen Boyle. Maureen Boyle. She's, a, she's great. Her, her enthusiasm for the subject she's an matter. She's investigative reporter. Yes. And she spent a lot of time yes. covering these cases, right. researching it. She's from the area. Yep. You know, and I mean, just like we're from Appalachia, and when we cover cases that are local, like to us, mm-hmm. like happened in our town, I feel like we were really passionate about it because we know the area, we know the people involved. Right. We, I think when you grow up there, you live there, when it's happening in your community, it does like boost your interest or make you more passionate about like we need to figure this it's out. It's true. You know? It's true. Because it's your it's your backyard. And, and she left she ended with the belief that it will be solved. It will be you solved. Know, I think so too, Dylan. I, I mean I think it's just a matter of time. But I do feel like we will eventually have some answers in this case. And but, I hope we do because again there are fifteen children out there who've lost their mothers, have no idea what happened, and they need some resolution. Because it's, it's the not knowing that is so painful for families. It's, it's just true. devastating. And these women, despite whatever their struggles were, they did not deserve this end at all. No one does. I mean, it's just horrible. But um, it's it's a very interesting case. And I, like I said, you know, I'm really surprised that it hasn't received more attention. Hell, yeah, I agree. Over I agree years. completely. Because it deserves the same amount of attention as the Green River Killer. Or Samuel Little. Well, see, that's that's my. Any, I mean, I just don't understand in some ways how the true crime community or the media just sort of picks and chooses the cases they want to spotlight and elevate. I when, don't get when it. When all victims deserve justice, and we and we need to know about all of these cases so that we can try to bring forth some kind of answer and push to get these cases solved. Yeah. I don't get that at all. You know, we, we we are constantly frustrated by that very point. You got your top 10 or 20, and that's what every time a, a, a documentary comes a out. A documentary or a new podcast starts, they will go down this list, and it's like, guys, I, I know. Now, I must say, I must say, um, I am going to watch the um, John Wayne the Gacy, Gacy confession tapes, tapes. Yep. because I, I that is in the top 10, top five, possibly. And yes, I've heard about Gacy a hundred times, but I do think, uh, and I've heard from some of our Discord well, you know, fam. Hearing the killer speak yes. in their words, I will never tire of that. Well, and I'm fairly certain he makes the accusation that he was not alone. I've heard, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to check that out, Uh, and I think Allison said it was good. And I'd like to thank Stephanie, the book goddess. She's awesome. We miss you, girl. Come back. We love you. (laughs) And uh, I thank Heather. Thank you for that wonderful story. Yeah, and I think it was my pleasure, Dylan. (laughs) And I thank our patrons, our sponsors of this episode. I'm a nerd, and I love researching and writing and putting together an episode and just trying my best to tell you a great story that is going to captivate your attention and, you know, maybe bring you some knowledge. I like to maybe dump some stuff on you, some facts that you didn't know about. Oh, my God. And maybe change some of the ideas you have about certain cases or teach you something you didn't know. Maybe introduce you to a case you'd never heard before. I, I like that because, like I said, I'm a nerd. You do all that. Um, okay, so I just dropped a couple of solo 
haha, just me, episodes on patreon.com slash mountain murders podcast. If you're into bonus content, you love mountain murders, can't get enough of us. Uh, we do update uh, over there, you know, uh, probably not as much as we should. We're going to get back to that a little bit more. Dylan, we got to focus. I'm telling you, without this inflation, I'm scrambling right now, folks. So if everyone that hears this podcast donates just $1 over at Patreon a month, we can go full time and we would love you forever for it. Because I <laughs> the have dream. to. <laughs> the I, dream. I have to go to work right now and I'm at my well, work. See, that's our issue is just finding the time. It's always it's in the way. We don't have the, the desire to do it. Yes. It's just trying to nail this guy down um and as i established before it takes him quite a bit of time to to even get ready hey he has to prepare he swing has, shifts he is has some a shit. ritual before we sit I down to say. record so there's that but uh, for our top tier patrons i do occasionally post uh, what i like to call little mini episodes it's just me it's solo and i've dropped a few of those over the last uh, day or two to give our top tier patrons a little bonus content uh, in addition to what we cover on Patreon. And all of the episodes are ad free on Patreon, so that is a benefit, as well as um, getting an invite to our Discord chat because, you know, we talk about that quite a bit, but it's super fun and we enjoy it. You can find us on Instagram, the Twitterverse, the and talks, and TikTok. Now, on TikTok, Dylan, I don't focus entirely on true crime. Actually, I don't do a lot of true crime on TikTok, but. I like to talk about a lot of ghost stories on TikTok. So if you're into that, you like spooky stuff, join us. Also, just discuss a lot of like Appalachian heritage and culture. Yeah, if you want me to read your comments 24 hours a day on the toilet, on the couch, in my underwear, uh, join our Patreon, get in our Discord chat. That's our fam. Oh, you can talk to you could reach out to me any time of the day or night. Yeah, that's the thing. When you're talking to Dylan, you're you're chatting him up in Discord. He's probably sitting on the on the john. I've got to say, some people's like, oh, on this one day we go, you know, attend our Discord. Ours is twenty four seven, bro. You can get Dylan three a.m. twenty four seven. Probably get me four a.m. because I'm an insomniac and I don't sleep. And we have such great friends there, and we love them all. Dude, I, it's like a family. It is so a family. Come join the fam. Okay, I got to go. It's like the the Manson. I got to go put my clothes on. Join the family. Join us. Okay, yeah, I have to go pick up my daughter. She's probably standing in the high school parking (laughs) lot. Like, where is my Oh, my gosh. All (laughs) righty. Okay. Bye, guys. We'll see you here in a couple of days with a midweek.